I'm here with Professor Lubomir Luchuk, who is Professor of Political Geography at the Royal Military College of Canada. Hello, Professor. Good afternoon. How are you doing today? I'm just fine. Beautiful day, so I'm enjoying uh, at least the sun. It's a bit cold, but uh, it's pleasant. Yeah, Sunday was nice. Very nice, yeah. A uh, promise of things to come, I hope. I hope so, too. Um, so this is a very, a very important week um, in terms of observing history. Um, it is, of course, the 75th anniversary of uh, Victory in Europe Day, VE Day. Um, but there's also some, um, some commemorations taking place um, regarding the uh, Ukrainian role in uh, Ukrainian Canadian role in uh, World War II and uh, that's been changed up quite a bit because of the COVID-19 um, pandemic. Uh, w tell me about it. Well there's just so many interesting connections to Kingston and, and unfortunately COVID-19 and, and VE Day. You're quite right I mean the most important thing to, to, to remember is that this Friday represents the 75th anniversary of Victory in Europe Day and over a million Canadians served in the armed forces and merchant navy during the Second World War. Over 50,000 were wounded or killed. In fact, almost 100,000 wounded and killed. And even from Kingston, thousands of men and women went from this region to, to serve in the armed forces. From RMC, over a thousand of whom, over a hundred, were killed. So you know, there's a, there's a, a real strong connection. But in terms of what you just said, for me. It goes right back to 1978. I was interviewing a lady on Colburn Street, actually, where you are right now, um, Mrs. Kharatanyuk, who told me about a man she said I should talk to. And I said, uh, well, who's he, who is this? And she said, his name is Gordon Panchuk, lives in Montreal, he's a teacher now, she said. And I said, never heard of him, and I hadn't. I did look him up several months later, and I learned a fascinating story. Uh, during the Second World War, over 35,000 Canadians of Ukrainian heritage from right across the country volunteered to serve in active duty overseas. This was disproportionate to the relative size of the community at the time. Uh, they served in all the branches and they served in every theater. Panchuk himself uh, was sent with the RCAF, he was a corporal then, to England, uh, actually to Ireland, and then got transferred to England. And there in Manchester, he found a very small colony of Ukrainians who had actually been on their way to Canada and who had been cut off by the First World War and remained in place and then settled in. He wrote in his diary at the time, who would have thought that so far from home I would find a home? And he got from them the idea of establishing a kind of a Ukrainian social club. They already had one there in Manchester. When he was transferred to London, he said, there are these hundreds of Ukrainians from Canada here, we need some kind of place where we can meet. So we established something called the Ukrainian Canadian Servicemen's Association. They rented a vicarage from St. James Parish in Paddington. Uh, they created their own London club, as they called it. And for the war years, they met there for fellowship and, and social activities. They had uh, divine liturgies or masses celebrated. They had get-togethers at Christmas and Easter. They kept a record of who was serving where, who was a casualty, who was given a distinction or an award, uh, who died. Uh, they tried to stay in touch and keep together. And this was not, uh, it, it was something completely unique and novel. Uh, when they actually got over to the continent uh, and began encountering Ukrainian refugees, the so-called displaced persons, Panchuk and some, not all of them, of these Ukrainian Canadians said, we've got to do something to help our brothers and sisters. So they organized another organization called the Central Ukrainian Relief Bureau. And with the help of the Ukrainian Canadian Congress here in Winnipeg, they organized uh, refugee relief and resettlement operations. And those lasted, amazingly, until 1952, Steve. So um, you have volunteers going over to serve in the armed forces of Canada and the Merchant Navy. They encounter other Ukrainians who are the victims of war, victims of both Nazi and Soviet tyranny. They rally to help them and they begin organizing relief efforts that result in some 35,000 of those so-called DPs, displaced persons, coming to Canada, my own parents among them. So you see how the story goes a full tilt. I mean, I started in 1978 hearing this man's name, had no clue who he was, met him, 
came to like him very much, met many of his fellow veterans over the years, wrote several books about them and with them, and then realized that we actually owed them a debt. So in 1995, uh, with some of my friends in the Ukrainian Canadian Civil Liberties Association, we put up a small bilingual plaque on the vicarage where they had had their London headquarters. And it's still there. A quarter of a century later, whenever I'm in London, I go and I look. But I have to tell you, quite honestly, I always thought that's not enough. That's it's, it's good, but we really should do something more to remember uh, the men and women that Panchuk called, and this was the title of his book he wrote, his memoirs, the heroes of their day. So we created this project called Heroes of Their Day about three years ago. And I began discussing the possibility of doing something a little more elaborate. So I went to St. James and I met the, the pastor there, the deacon, um, Father Owen, Father Thomas, great guys, worked with the diocesan committee and the Association of Ukrainians of Great Britain. And so with the diocese and our Ukrainian counterparts in Great Britain, we came up with a Heroes of Their Day project. So we raised entirely through public subscription about $100,000, and we commissioned a British stream glass artist to do a window, and you have the image of that window, and it was to be unveiled on Friday, the 8th of May, the 75th anniversary of Victory in Europe Day, a day that was obviously very important for these men and women. Well, unfortunately, COVID um, has decided to delay our plans. So the window was done, everything was done, everything was set up, ready to go, but unfortunately, uh, I can't be in London. I was supposed to be leaving for London today. Um, that won't happen. We postponed until the autumn. It could be more likely than not around Remembrance Day. But we have decided to nevertheless make sure this date does not go past unnoticed. So uh, we have sent out over three and a half thousand postcards to veterans and their family members across Canada, some internationally to the United Kingdom, the United States, Australia. We have taken out of half-page notice in the Globe and Mail that'll be there on Friday. I know there's a story being written about it in the Globe and there'll be uh, other reports, I hope, in other newspapers. So we have remembered them. We will remember them as the way, of course, we talk about our veterans. We will remember them and we have. So I'm, I'm very pleased that, frankly, I've been able to uh, work with my friends in England and the United States and across the country. And even in this time of pandemic, even in this time when we're sort of locked down and and can't do as much as we'd like to be able to do, we haven't forgotten the men and women whose service and sacrifice, quite frankly, made possible the Canada we have today. So we're anxious, we're feeling frustrated, some of us are a bit depressed, we're indoors, we're, we're not having the social interactions we want. I get all that, trust me, I, I feel it too. And so do my loved ones. But these, at the same time, we can't forget the history that's unfolded before us and what wraps around us. We, I wouldn't be here, I wouldn't be here for sure if it hadn't been for those men and women. And I owe them my life, in effect, my, my, my career, my prospects, my, my everything that's been good in my life is because those men and women went overseas and, and fought the good fight. And now I have remembered them. And so with my colleagues, we've, we've done the right thing. We've hallowed the memory other men and women who went overseas and never returned, those who came back injured in body and mind, those who came back and went on to have normal lives, and all the people they rescued. So it's, uh, you know, it's again, one of those projects that I've, I've had the privilege of being associated with and very grateful to, as I say, the colleagues across Canada and abroad, to my colleagues at RMC that have tolerated some of my enthusiasms. And I, you know, you can hear it in my voice, my enthusiasms is a good way of putting it. Um, but I'm done, it's done. It, it, it you know, it, it isn't going to be done Friday, but it will be done. And uh, so I couldn't be happier, even at this time of uh, pandemic. Hopefully we'll have a chance to talk to you again um, when you head over, hopefully on Remembrance Day or around to actually physically be there to unveil the, uh, the stained glass. Um, turning uh, to your um, uh, being a professor at RMC, I mean, this is a place where one would think the impending um, 75th anniversary is very much in the minds of the, the cadets there and the, um, the, the professors and everybody else. Um, how are the students uh, planning to observe this date, given the strictures of COVID-19 lockdown? 
Yes, well, I think most of the students now have actually been uh, sent home. So they will presumably be doing it at the military bases or wherever they find themselves now. Uh, I know that the principal, Dr. Koval, um, is very well aware of the uh, upcoming anniversary and is planning to release some kind of statement, I'm presumably with the commandant as well. Uh, I'm sure it will be observed at the CFB Kingston and in any of the military institutions around town. The, the particulars of that, I don't know. Obviously, the most important thing that everyone is concerned about now is public safety and the health of the public, the health of our students, the health of our staff. So I don't think there will be any kind of gathering as it would have been normally you would have expected something. That's not going to happen any more than I'm going to go to England. Um, but that said, I think uh, there'll be many people around Kingston. There are so many families here whose fathers or grandfathers, mothers or grandmothers uh, fought and served in the Second World War. I mean, you see lots of their names of the ones that died in, in service on the memorial arc. At, at RMC, the cemeteries are unfortunately full of them. Um, there are fewer and fewer veterans left. So I would urge your viewers on Friday, uh, pause for just a moment and in your thoughts or in your prayers, as you wish, uh, remember those who made possible the kind of country we all celebrate, you know, for all its faults and all our grumbles and all the rest of it. But regardless of your politics or where you live, this is an important date. And it was made important by the sacrifice of people just like us 75 years ago. And I think that's that's a critical thing to remember. And so I'm sure that my students, there are a few left on campus, but most of the ones who have now gone home will, will remember this day because they are of that same ilk. They are of that same kind of person. They are people who volunteer, who come to RMC, who study hard. Well, most of them study hard. And uh, I, I won't be completely uh, a booster, but they're good kids. They're good kids. They're uh, young men and women from across the country who are proud to serve their country, who sometimes, as we know, tragically uh, die in service, as, as we saw recently, uh, and who we remember because they make this a great country without having to boast about it. I think, yes, um, absolutely. I believe, you know, we need to remember and we also need to understand that, um, you know, the sacrifices don't just happen in war. We saw that mm -hmm. last week with that tragic news. I mean, when you send yep. people out to play with toys that bite, um, things happen and these things are necessary to protect our freedoms. Absolutely. The world is unfortunately not the place we might all wish it to be. And so we need um, a professional, competent military. Uh, the young men and women who come and train at CFP Kingston, train at Fort Frontenac, train at RMC and in the region are great Canadians. You know, I, I've had the privilege, and I, and I mean that, the privilege of, of teaching some of them now for 30 years and I look back on that with great pride because I, I was never in uniform, but I have nothing but respect for the uniform. It's, it's, um, it's a calling for most of them and uh, they're wonderful people. I think that's a good place to end. Um, hopefully, uh, you know, keep in touch. We'll talk again in the near future, hopefully uh, next time, maybe on Skype from uh, London. That would be lovely. Thank you, Stephen. Stay well. You too. Stay safe.